All right, welcome back, Bass Galaxy, to Into the Great Wide Open Season 2. Glad to have you with us. Riled up to get this season kicked off. We've got a quality guest lined up tonight. we got Dakota Ebear uh, making his way back from the MLF. Back slumdogging it in the open, so can't wait to hear uh, hear his take on it. And and he's been a top-tier angler for the last few years. So going to be lots to talk about there, but first we got... Uh, Got a couple things to go through. Hey, Brad, welcome back, bud. Oh, it's so good to be back. Uh, just freezing my ass off the last weekend and ready to go bass fishing and podcasting, I guess. Yeah, you came out of your ice fishing retirement and couldn't have picked a damn worse weekend. Yeah, 70 below windshield and 25 below air temps. Not great for ice fishing. <laughs> no. <laughs> you get... Uh... Get your boat all rigged up. Brad's actually going down. Uh, do a, a pre, a preface, preface, whatever it's called, precursor. Get no. a little, little heads up on what's going on here. We got Brad's doing all nine opens this year. They're kicking off um, right at the end of the month here, and uh, I'm just sidelining. I'm doing three up north and uh, national qualifier or two. Um, so I'm just coattailing off whatever Brad, Brad's got on the go and. I'll be here in the war room. So what's the word, bud? You get your stickers on, your motor strapped on or what? Uh, they're strapping on the new motor as we speak. I have my boat wrapped, uh, tackle all ready to go. Uh, quite a job. I mean, we've only had two months off with Christmas and Thanksgiving being part of it. So it's been a lot of work, a lot of turnaround and ready to go. I'm hoping to leave next Tuesday, Wednesday, get down to Okeechobee and start the season off right. You know, no one complains when bass tournament touring anglers complain about how much work it is to get ready. Eh? <laughs> I was like, all right, we got to get all this brand new shit. I got all these new wrap stack tackle boxes. I got to put all my new lures in, <laughs> but it is a lot of work. Like I hear that, especially if you're changing boats and changing graphs and, She's a prodigy. It's a lot of work because there's a lot of stuff you can't control. You know, it's like you're wait for stuff to get shipped. You're feeling anxious because you're ready to go and nothing's getting done. And, you know, it doesn't matter how much you worry about it or how much to work on it. You know, it only gets here as quick as it does. And trying to get everything done, you know, in the North Country in the middle of winter, you know, it's not an easy task. I mean, you take your boat to go get wrapped. It's 20 below. Everything's full of salt and grime and just a lot of extra work. Yeah. Well, I'll try adding it with an extra border in the way and see how you like that. My, uh, I got my brand new uh, Powertran Impulse uh, minty jack plates that Brad and I are both running this year. Uh, you know, kind of new, new technology with a lot of features like auto lift and uh program programmable like heights and everything like that but mine's been sitting in my buddy's house at the border for for a little bit now and <laughs> the boat's looking a little naked without it so it's even more pain in the ass when you got to do that i can't imagine what you have to go through i mean you travel more than anyone else and yeah dealing with that border you can't get anything across there i, I bet you it's a nightmare you can get it across you just got to pay up <laughs> brought some uh i brought running powerhouse again this year but i stepped her up i put two uh 60 amp 16 volts in for the for the graph um just for no reason at all other than to ball out um the the 100 amps you know that 100 amp 16 volt we were the whole house was running it last year and she's absolutely beauty but you know throw a little more Why power not? in there you never know how much how many graphs you're going to throw on there's going to be live scope breaks and six or seven graphs on some of these rigs and damn transducers it'll your boat will be like a damn microwave coming down the lake it's i i thought someone told me millican even has the the backup things on his raptors this year so it's yeah, getting pretty brakes. technical yeah the brakes i need brakes <laughs> it's gonna be if i have to start throwing those on it's gonna i'm gonna have to shut her down on rigging my own boat at some point because it's already gone from a one day job now with scopes and isolated batteries and everything like that, it's turned into like a two and a half day. Start throwing brakes and all kinds of wild shit on there. Be there for a week. Yeah. I mean, I wired my own 
powerhouse lithiums in this year and that's about the extent of my knowledge i, yeah, I hope you right. got a fire extinguisher <laughs> no no it's all good it was it was pretty much wired for the other batteries so everything's good i'm pretty sure everything's okay good. as long as you didn't make any executive decisions in there i eh, might have made a few you know you don't need <laughs> all that stuff in there do you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of those uh, circuit breakers are just spares, <laughs> spare parts. Yeah, I was, tell, I was asking Raz about it, and he's like, I might have to rewire that when you get down to Florida. I'm like, nah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, looking forward to that. I'm uh, I'm in a different boat, but I feel like I'm more prepared than ever. I'm just going to one tournament, that national qualifier, uh, leaving at the end of the month also. And like, I got all my hooks and these foam boxes. I've never been more dialed. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to fish one tournament. <laughs> like, weeks of preparation. I've been on that Omnia Premium Pro app like crazy, like looking at the water temps, uh, looking where the wind's been crashing, the water clarity. I'm fully addicted to that. Um, you can run yeah. a free trial on that if you check out below. We'll just link it below and check it out for free. If you like it, keep it rolling. If not, whatever. She's a freebie. Yeah, it's quite a tool for, you know for preparation and i mean for the guy that you know maybe doesn't have 12 graphs on his boat and maybe he's fishing from shore it's quite a tool for that too yeah bub oh this is the first time i'm doing the owner player coach ginge is uh ginge is off detail tonight we're we're trying to dj ourselves here so uh we'll see when dakota hops on but we got plenty to talk about until he gets rolling here all the the new formats new coverage practice period what do you think about the two week uh cutoff with two weeks of uh no information now i think it'll help a little bit i mean i'm under the philosophy we shouldn't have no no information no practice i mean not no practice but a limited maybe three four days at most and just try to fare it up a little bit i guess but you know, you can't make everyone happy. I think it will, you know, it'll cut off the information gathering for sure. But, you know. But you, you can still gather it even. Oh, yeah. So you can get your old well, before you had. You gather it up until the first day of practice. And now it's two weeks before. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big change. And it was 28 days off limits. Now it's only 14 days off limits. So that's another change. Yeah, the pre-practicers will love that. Yeah. You know how many guys are on Okeechobee right now? Uh, I don't know if they can be. We Our first day of practice is the 25th, so I'm thinking it's off okay. limits right now. Days ago then. Yeah. Are you going to get your ass down there to do some practice this year, or are you going to just do a old hat? Uh, I'm probably not going to pre-practice anything down south, but uh, definitely pre-practice the ones that are close, Leech and uh, Lacrosse. Yeah, I already pre-practiced Leech. My first pre-practice in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Your boat I drove was... my ass down there. Yeah, it was uh, like mid to late November. We had a freak... Uh, a freak warm weekend for November, like usually you literally ice fishing that same weekend. And I was like, Oh, it's nice. What am I going to do? And I drove down to Leech. I was like, I'll go drive around. It's whatever, five and a half hours. Like, I'll go out around a little bit. Yeah, so anyway, pre-practice went. around, put her on the bunks and it was like getting damn below freezing. Next morning I went to go and my Lund was frozen right to the bunks. Trailer was floating. I'm out there on the beach, like stand, jumping up and down. I left it in the water for, you know, I say 10 minutes, it was probably like four, and I just got pissed off and went home. That was my pre-practice experience of my life. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, at least you got a half a day idling around there. Yeah, I don't know what kind of good that'll do. How many Minnesota boys are fired up for that one? Uh, everyone I talk to is pretty fired up. I think uh, there's going to be about 100 winners in that deal, so that'll be interesting. <laughs> um, Are there lots of guys that – um have been saying like i wish an open would come to minnesota and then not sign up ah uh, a little bit of that i mean i think you know we actually have two well one's on leech and one's on lacrosse which is on the border of minnesota so 
for the Northern Division or whatever, Division Three, the one you're doing, it's never been an easier travel for a Midwest person. No. So, yeah, no. I mean, there's people fired up. I mean, I don't think they get the wrath that's coming, though. I mean, you know what the wrath is. and Yeah, 225 meat wagons for four and a half days of sticking them. Yeah, I mean, our <laughs> our fish may be dumb, per se, but they don't take pressure very well. So Leech Lake is known for, like, even 50 boat tournaments. Practice is really hard on it. So it'll be an interesting derb, that's for sure. 50 boater puts the heat on her. Yeah. They might just have to close the lake after we leave. <laughs> she done for the summer, boys. <laughs> Yeah, it is. They're never, I mean, it's going to be an experience those bass has never seen before. I don't, I mean, there'll be a lot of live scoping and a lot of pinging going on. A lot of hook setting and a lot of should have been here yesterday type things, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, don't get your hopes up after day one of practice. <laughs> no. no. I've always seen that before. Oh, well. The hell yeah. else is happening. I uh, had a great fall duck hunting across the Midwest parts of Canada. Uh, got everything pretty much set up. I mean, it's been a lot of work, but ready to get back to it. Like, it's crazy how you go from, you know, a full-time job and working five days a week and six days a week and not having a job and just fishing. It's been Quite a different transition, but uh, I enjoy it a lot and ready to get back on the road and go see the rest of the country, I guess, what we didn't see last year. Yeah. Well, when I called you earlier today, what the hell were you up to? I was playing Fortnite so I could get better <laughs> at scoping. If you can't beat these 20-year-olds, maybe join them, you know? So video games will make you better at it? No, I suck at video games. I'm not very good at scoping. So, oh yeah, I had to call you out on that though. No, that's good. I would. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get on uh, the man of the hour here, Dakota E Bear. I'll text him. He's probably running late. Bobby Lane and us. That's obviously the wrong number. We're lucky we didn't have some random jump on the podcast. How's she going, man? She's good. Second time's the charm. <laughs> How's it going, bud? Good, man. Good. How are you? I'm good. How many podcasts is this this week? It's a few. It's a few. I, we're, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to leave and my house really until mid February because uh, the first event, my my first event was going to be on Toledo, and then the second event was going to be on Sam Rayburn, and I live right in between the two, so uh now all of a sudden we've moved the season forward of me traveling up by a couple weeks and and throwing a bunch of you know drama in the mix so yeah it's been good <laughs> yeah no i'm looking forward to listening to a couple i uh i caught you on the bass university i think it was this fall and mm -hmm. uh that was a good one man i liked hearing the up-and-comer story you got a different you know different story than than lots of guys and Right. When you're uh, you make an announcement, you jump over to the opens. I was fired right up on it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys having me, really. <laughs> oh, dude, thanks for coming. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we pretty much just take a look at the opens. Brad and I both fished all nine last year. Uh, he's doing all nine. I'm just doing three this year. But um, you know, a couple couple big waves like this, we uh, we got to get you on and and see what your take is on the whole thing and. You know what, where where your mind's kind of at. Awesome, yeah. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to fish in the opens. Uh, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get in. You know, I, I kind of tormented around with the uh, the decision of, of of actually making the jump to to try to do that, and uh, it, it was a decision that took a lot of time, a lot of thought, a lot of prayer for me. Um, it wasn't one that I took lightly, you know. And it seemed like the longer it went on after I had actually even decided that I was going to fish the Bass Pro Tour, um, it, it still was weighing on me pretty hard that I was like, man, I just really want to do something else. I really want to kind of start fresh somewhere. And um, 
this late in the venture, I felt like the, the, the chances of me getting in were slim to none. And I think it was just a perfect storm where I happened to reach out to them at the exact time, maybe that a spot become available and I got in and I felt like, well, if there's an opportunity right now, it must be just meant to be. So here we go. That's awesome, man. And obviously people are going to tell you this, but that takes a big set of knots to jump, you know, <laughs> jump ship like that. Cause it's not like you're way back in the standings. Like we've, you know, we've seen guys jump over before that are kind of mid pack and lots of guys came this year, but. You're going out, was it fourth or fifth you got this year? I know you were fourth and fifth in the last two years. So yeah, like, I think you're going fifth. out in the top five. Yeah, I think fifth, you know. And there was a lot of con- yeah, guys Guys reached out like, man, well, if you don't want anger of the year, you wouldn't be leaving, you know, because I broke down at St. Clair. And I, if I don't break down at St. Clair and if I just catch a limit, I think that I, you know, I, I probably hands down went anger of the year. But I told him, I was like, really, it's, it's not about that. Um, it wouldn't have changed anything. Really, where I was standing at in the in the in the standings or whatever was never something I really took into consideration as far as whether that I would stay or go. Uh, the financial opportunities over there was one of the bigger things that was keeping me um, over there on that platform. And, you know, I mean, let's let's face it. Um, over the last two years, I've gained some of the best business partners that I could ever ask for. Um, I've been fortunate enough to win, you know, quite a bit of money. That's, that's been a life changing amount of money really for me, honestly. Um, I didn't have anything when I started this, I slept in my truck for several years and, and, uh, ate peanut butter and crackers, you know? So, um, the, you know, the financial success I've had at the Bass Pro Tour has kind of helped me make this decision or gave me the freedom to make this jump. But in reality, it's not even about any of that. Um, it's just about, you know, the fact that I love bass fishing. I mean, absolutely love it. And just like we all do, right? Everybody that's yeah. watching this has that same passion. Um, and I'm young enough in my career that I felt like there's still a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of things that I want to accomplish. Um, and so, you know, to be able to compete on that Elite Series stage and maybe hold up a classic trophy one day is is at the top of the list. So if I'm ever going to do it, this is the opportunity and this is where we're going. So here we go. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I like the attitude and I like the planning because, um, you know, it seems like a, a lot of guys kind of get the golden handcuffs on them and you don't have the freedom to to make those, you know, those kind of wild decisions and life changing decisions. But it sounds like you set yourself up pretty good, to, you know, just kind of plow your own path. Yeah, um, I, I didn't ever like I dreamed of being able to fish one day for a living, but I never dreamed of having the success that I've had. I mean, that's all been such a blessing. Like, and yes, I have there. I'm not going to take away from the work that I put in uh, because I, I, I did my part and I'm doing my part. I'm definitely going to do my part now that I'm fishing the opens and having to requalify for another top level trail. But I, I'm so thankful for, you know, the success that I've had. I don't take it for granted. It didn't come easy. And, um, but yeah, it, it's it's been it's been a wild ride. Like I didn't see all of this happening the way that it has, and I've just been enjoying the ride, you know. And um, this is no different. This is kind of one of those things where I felt like it was the right thing to do, and we're going to put everything we have into it. We're going to see where it goes. Hell yeah, man! That's uh, I'm fairly glad I'm not fishing all nine this year because I know that you've <laughs> been around. You, you know, you're kind of the Iron Man of fishing the last couple of years. I don't know if there's anyone fishing as many um you know triple a or better events as you are you uh are you going to keep grinding on like other circuits and to the opens oh, yeah. or is it- absolutely yeah, yeah man. So that's that's kind of it like i felt like i was at a point where i could get complacent pretty easy over there on the basketball tour and i don't mean that as from a competition standpoint because those guys you can't get complacent over there and still do well I, I'm saying I could have got complacent in a sense and maybe not done as well. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I, I don't know. I, I just know me. Right. And, um, and being in the position now where I've got to go back through the qualifying ranks, man, it's going to make me absolutely hungry again. And, uh, and make me really work hard for that success. And with that, uh, I'm actually excited for the travel schedule. You know, I mean, we're going to go all over the place from, you know, from here in Texas all the way to Florida and from Florida all the way to Minnesota and everywhere in between. The only thing I'm bummed out about is that I'm going to miss out on the New York swing. I, I have, uh, I thoroughly enjoy fishing up there. 
Um, I have some people that I've met over there over the years that are like family to me, and I was looking forward to spending some time with them. But unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to make the Champlain Invitational or obviously the St. Lawrence BPT. So that's kind of a bummer. But aside from that, uh, I'm going to fish several of the Invitationals, probably going to fish a couple Toyota Series, and I'm going to fish all nine Opens. Damn. This guy's a that's killer, a Brad. That's a plate full right there. But I love it. I mean, I love it. Like, and when you're fishing that much and you do, like, you can't burn yourself out. But whenever you get in that rhythm, even if you have a bad event, whenever you follow it right up with another event, if you can keep your train up, like, you can keep this head, like, straight and say, all right, I had a bad one. Let's go to another one and let's go have a good one. If you can keep that attitude, it can really, you know, help build, I feel like, your confidence and your ability to fish in different circumstances all over the place um, because whenever you leave Okeechobee and you drive all night and you get to a place like Chickamauga the next day and you got to start practicing, you got two days before the next event, you can't be thinking about what you did at Okeechobee and how you were successful there or maybe how you weren't successful there. You're at a, a totally different place and you've got you've to be really comfortable making decisions on the fly and fishing freely. And I think that's something that's really helped me be successful over the years. Yeah, bopping around derby to derby. Do you think if you weren't fishing all those other tournaments, would you do like the big massive 20 to 30 day pre-practice that lots of these guys do? Or do you think that bopping around like just keeps you sharp and keeps you on your toes? And Yeah, I think the bopping around keeps me sharp and keeps me on my toes. Now, granted, now early on in my career, I would go and spend, you know, a week before a Toyota series at a, at a fishery or maybe a week before a college event if I could. Now, so, I mean, I'd bring a tent and camp out. It wasn't like I was staying in a nice place for a a long time if i if i could afford it if i had saved up enough, enough enough if i had saved up enough money i would go and do that kind of stuff i think that that time on the water is irreplaceable i think you get better when you're doing that but do i think it necessarily helps you be better for that tournament in a way no not all. so wrapped up on you know you find so much in a week or 30 days or whatever that you're trying to run all these things that you found over the last month in reality you got what three days of competition in the open i mean you can only run so much and you need to be fishing current stuff that's relevant to that day that minute that time yeah gotcha yeah, yeah like you go somewhere somewhere like lake hartwell for 10 days and pre-practice and marked every brush pile like you wouldn't be able to fish them in you know in three days if you just hopped yeah. every every pile to pile to pile to pile so how you like you would now having an unlimited supply of brush piles or good brush piles is key. I mean, that's how guys win on those lakes, but there's just a fine line there, right? I mean, you can only run so many. And before you know it, you got so many marks on your graph. I know we've all been there. I've been here there at Rayburn. Like I don't upload old waypoints typically at Rayburn because if I take every waypoint that I had at Rayburn, this thing's going to be one big blue blob and I'm not going to be able to differentiate between I'm, God dang it, where's that brush pile mark at? And then I'm, you know, like it just gets, yeah. it gets diluted really. Yeah. Is it, uh, is it burning you up a little bit, missing the, the opener on Toledo Bend now? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, I spent a few days over there, uh, pre fishing and I kind of, man, they were right where I, I, I wanted them, right where I was hoping they would be, figured they would be. And, um, uh, yeah, that was going to be a good one, you know, but uh, my money's on Justin Cooper. I'm going to call that out. It's going to be his first Bass Pro Tour event, and I think he's going to show them boys what he's about. So I'm hoping he wins that thing. And uh, it's going to be a great event. They'll catch a lot of fish. I was really looking forward to that event being a five fish tournament uh, because I felt like if it was like the Elite Series are going to be there a few weeks later, it's yeah. going to be it's going to be something exciting if the weather permits. Uh, you could see, you know, bags over, you could see somebody catch over 40 pounds, like no doubt. Wow. And, um, now will it happen? The stars are going to have to align. The weather's going to have to be right. Guys got to find the right thing, but it, it, it could happen. And it could have happened in our Bass Pro Tour event if they would have kept the format what it was, but nonetheless, it'll still be exciting event to watch. There'll be a lot of fish caught. Yeah, we went through the, uh, probably the worst week of the whole year last year to fish it. It was still freaking good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The place has been – it's been a sleeper for a long time. Um, I, I don't mind saying that a little bit because Rayburn, for one, needs some pressure off of it because it's beginning – it's 
I mean, it's getting pounded so bad, but right, Toledo is so big and so expansive that um, really, I mean, there's a, if there's at any given time, let's just say there's 20 places you can win on Rayburn. Like if there's 20 spots at any given time that you can win at on Rayburn, there's like 120 at Toledo. I mean, there's just so much to fish. It's so big. It's there's different patterns, different everything. It's going to be a great, great event for both tours. Yeah. Definitely some guys are going to crack some stumps too. <laughs> oh, no doubt. No doubt. No, no doubt. You pull into town and the first three things you see are like fiber boat repair shops. <laughs> it's just yeah. a damn graveyard. Yeah. Uh, a fellow that knows how to work on a prop can make a living around here. I guarantee you that. Yeah, I'm sure. going to switch to aluminum next time I go there, I think, and just bring a bucket of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, ask this damn guy a question. You got the Iron Man of Bass and hopping over to the opens. <laughs> I didn't get him hopping over. No, uh, <laughs> what was I going to ask you? <laughs> so, so you were, I mean, I'm more interested in your past, like the, the rodeo stuff. What, tell us a little bit about that. Man, I think that, 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 uh, history of like that lifestyle, you know, which I really, really enjoyed. I think that taking that lifestyle, and kind of applying it to bass fishing is what has helped me be successful. Um, you know, I've always enjoyed traveling and doing that kind of stuff. Even when we were rodeo and I, I, I like going to new places and meet new people. And I still have some really good friends of mine to this day that still rodeo professionally. And they spend, you know, 200 days a year on the road going from, you know, bull riding to bull riding to bull riding to rodeo to rodeo to rodeo. And, uh, that's the way those guys make a living and they have to hustle. You know, whenever you get bucked off of one, they got to get in the truck and drive all night and get to another rodeo and get on another one. So there's a mental approach to that, right? Which yeah. I'm a bull fighter. I wasn't very good at bull riding. Uh, uh -huh. Difference, right? My job was, I got on bulls for a while, but you know, I wasn't God's gift to bull riding. I'll just say that. And I realized I was getting thrown off and ran over and not getting paid. And then I realized that I could get, I'd still get run over, but at least I would get paid as being a bullfighter and I could pay my bills. So that's kind of how I got through college, to be truthful about it. And, um, but, you know, there's a mental side of that. You know, if you have a bad night rodeo and, you know, you, you get in the truck and you drive to another event and you got to flush that. You got to put it behind you because those guys that are riding bulls for a living, they've got to tie their hand in that bull rope the next night and they oh can't God. be thinking what happened the night before, you know? So, um, that those mentality kind of being cowboy tough and just, man, just going and grinding. I kind of apply that to the fishing side of things. And I think it's helped me be successful. Is I give you, I give you credit. Like, I mean, I'm, I, I around cattle down in Iowa we have some farms and man those bulls are so big there's no way in God's green earth I get on top of one of those things well y'all probably got some beef cattle those bulls probably yeah. weigh a little more than the average buck and bull but some of them are pretty big I mean the average buck and bull weighs about 1200 pounds 1300 pounds but he's still heavy enough to hurt you there ain't no doubt about that and every now and then you get one out there it's about 2100 that's real mean and and he's pretty scary I ain't gonna lie to you but it's just mind over matter. It's all part of it. And it's something you get, you just get accustomed to. Same thing as going and fishing as many tournaments as I fish. Your body gets accustomed to that, right? Like you, you yeah. get accustomed to getting beat by waves every day. You get accustomed to standing on the deck of that boat from daylight till dark. If you don't do that for like a month and you get out there, and you go fish daylight till dark for three days straight, you're going to be hurting a little bit. Oh, yeah. And, and those guys that are, that are uh, in rodeo and stuff, they, they have the same thing. Like, you know, if you if you get on bulls every day or not, you know, they don't get on every day, but typically, you know, let's say three times a week and, and you, your body kind of gets a, a used to the abuse. And then if you go like a, a week or two without getting on, all of a sudden you do, it feels like every part of your body is like about to fall apart whenever you even if you you might jump off and land on your feet and walk, you know, walk to the bucket shoots right. like your whole body feels like it's fixing to fall apart because you're just not conditioned to it. So all that stuff kind of matters, man, about staying in shape and staying mentally tough and all that. And I've just tried to kind of take some of that cowboy mentality, apply it to bass fishing, and I think it's helped me out along the way. Is Was your mentality on the rodeo, like, were you as hardcore in that scene? as Because you, you're a, a pretty big standout for being a hard worker in fishing. When yeah. you were on the bull riding scene, was, was it just, were you just like standard issue or did you outwork those boys too? 
No, I, I worked hard at it. Uh, you know, honestly, I, my parents instilled that in me at a young age, you know, and um, my mom and my dad, both in their own separate ways, they, they work extremely hard. And um, that's all I've ever known as a kid growing up was hard work. I mean, at one point I watched my mom work three jobs just to make ends meet and keep a roof over my head. And um, I'll never forget that. Those are valuable lessons that, that uh, you take with you forever. And it's, you know, that's all I know. So no matter what it is in life that I've done, like I've applied those lessons and I can say that about, I've not always done things right. But I've always yeah. done full throttle and put everything I have into them whenever I finally decide to commit to something. And rodeo was no different. I worked my butt off on that as well. And uh, but it's kind of like uh, so fighting bulls, for example, what I was, you know, what I was doing mostly, um, I would just like every day I would work out, stay in shape. You know, we did training exercises to be in more at, like agility and stuff. We'd watch video kind of you learn how those bulls buck and how guys ride and when they're going to fall off. And the whole key to that thing was being able to predict guys like seeing, seeing a guy buck off before he actually did like seeing him fall off before he would actually even fall off. And you'd be able to anticipate where he's going to fall, how that bull was going to react and where you could be at the right place at the right time as everything was happening, you know, in full speed. And so there's a lot that goes into that as far as being in shape, being mentally tough and, and making the right decision at the right time. So I, I, I did. I put a lot into it, to be honest with you. Where Can you, like, lasso stuff with a rope? Yeah, I can rope a little bit. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to call myself, like, a, a, you know, sure enough team roper here in the state of Texas because you better be pretty dang good if you call yourself, you know, a team roper here and around here because these guys are really good. But I would say that I'm like a BFL kind of guy when it comes to roping. You know, if we're going <laughs> yeah. to play think- I yeah, think that I think I can, that roping will come in handy in the opens when people get too close. You just lasso them and pull them out of the boat and take off. I could, I could, I'm, I can rope good enough to do that. I will say Perfect. that. <laughs> but you know, you that's think funny. you can out rope Joey C? Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how much of a cowboy Joey is. I think it, I think they got some cows though. I think they got they got some cows. He, he wears the hat well though, so we'll give him that. <laughs> you have like, to have a roping derby at the the first elite like, event you fish when you get there. Joey's a good guy. Yeah, we we might have to pull out a roping dummy and see and see uh and see. you got you guys could rope uh, Matt Robertson. That'd be fun. Like that'd be a good time. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be interesting. I don't know how I, I don't know how he would react to that, but yeah, yeah. Oh, he'd be down. He'd be yeah. down for it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, I like Joe. He's a good old boy. But uh, no, uh, that you'd be, you would be surprised how many similarities the rodeo industry and the fishing industry kind of has. So it's been it's been cool, and a lot of the guys that rodeo they love to fish, and you know we you know a lot of guys that that fish we like to follow rodeo so it's it's kind of a cool deal how about the uh like the sponsor grind side on the rodeo is it as prevalent is it as cutthroat is it existent or like how does that look man i i really didn't get far enough along into that to really get i mean nobody was sponsoring me really rodeo at that point um but i would it's it's pretty similar I think I don't know that it says cutthroat, you know, like you can't it seems like just here in the last few years, like the social media influencers are actually kind of finally start to take place in rodeo as well. You know, you've got some guys that are that are starting to really make a big name for themselves through social media as well. So that that I would say they were kind of a little bit old school, you know, for a long time until now. But uh, I don't know that it's as cutthroat. You know, and there's not as many. Like, it's just different. Like in the bull riding industry, if you don't if you don't ride bulls very well, there's no faking that. There's no, there's no like you're not gonna go make a YouTube channel about riding bulls if you ain't JB Mooney or somebody. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. And Dad ain't gonna wrap your your bull with a bunch of decals to make you look like a pro max either. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, wear your, you know, your spurs and chaps in the bar room and tell everybody how much of a bull rider you are, but they're going to laugh at you and they're like, no, you're not. I don't know. It's easier just to call out the BS and the rodeo scene, I feel like. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're, whenever you perform on that, on that platform, like, 
everybody sees it and there ain't no I, I can't like i said it boils down to this i can't make a youtube channel and tell everybody how good of a bull rider i am unless i get out there and tie my hand the bull rider in front of people and go you know perform so i would say the guys that get the good sponsorships and rodeo probably truly earn it and um and, and you know the and it's just that i, I don't know that's just kind of where you know what, what yeah. i would say the difference between that is and i don't mean that bad on anybody that's doing well in the fishing industry as an influencer uh, I mean, heck, I'm doing everything I can right now to build my social channels and stuff. And that's something that I didn't do initially. Uh, I really focused on trying to be successful on the water because in that way, like having that kind of rodeo background, like I didn't want to try to be somebody I wasn't. Like mm. for a long time, I'm not going to go make a video about throwing a 6XD when nobody gives a dang why I'm even throwing a 6XD because I ain't never caught crap on a 6XD. You know what I'm saying? Like I just yeah. didn't feel natural doing all that like i didn't feel natural trying to be somebody on social media before i'd ever accomplished anything um fortunately now i have some great companies that i work with and they want me to do this and they believe in me and they're pushing me to do it and so i'm excited about it now and like whenever people reach out like hey man i, I want to see how you did that like I i'm glad to be able to show them now but so I'm not saying anything bad about, you know, the influencer stuff and all social media because there are guys that make that are making a great living doing it and they don't even have to fish a tournament. Um, yeah, and, so and most of them, like if you talk to the ones with, you know, talk to like John B or someone like that who's got a couple million subscribers, right. like he'll tell you outright he's not a turn, you know, he never claims to be like the best and they're still, they're hard workers in that regard. You know, oh, like absolutely. the guys at the top of the game there are working as hard as the guys at the top of the game in the in the tournament fishing side. But yeah. I totally understand what you mean, like especially the last few years, like kind of all the there's just so many damn channels now and there's a lot of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I, the sponsors read through the bullshit, though. Like, I mean, you know, they know. They and there because there are influencers that can move the needle for these companies. That's pro, that's proven. And it's it's very prevalent right now, and that's very important, right? Because these companies need to need to move the needle, and I need these companies to move the needle so that you know they can invest in us and the organizations and all that. So we're all pulling the rope in the same direction, right? Like I'm okay. Like it doesn't listen. Like Tyler Anderson works with Striking and and lose and stuff. Like I I want to see him successful because he's helping me help Striking and lose. Right? We're all working for the same thing here, you know. Um, yeah. So I'll, so you can't take anything away from that. But I think, you know, there's, for me personally. Lost him. Oh, no. I got, I got, a, I got a phone call, dude. Was it good? I I rejected it. You good? Yeah, you're all good. Oh, you're good. Okay. For me personally, I, I want to do the best job I can do for these companies. And I want to be able to try to have a positive impact on as many people as I can. I can do that through my social media. Right. And that's something that I'm working very hard towards doing. But it's very important to me personally to try to be the best I can be on the water. I'm a very competitive person by nature and I want to win. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to cut around that. You know, um, I want to hold up a classic trophy. I want to hold up a Red Crest trophy and, and a Bass Pro Tour trophy. And I didn't get to do that. Um, not saying that I want one day, maybe hopefully, but those are goals that I have that are very important to me as a person, you know, not, and, and the, 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 whereas like the success of my brand overall is going to depend on social media, but you got to be able to separate that, right? Like what's important to you, what's going to make you happy, you know? And, uh, it's not necessarily like me beating a certain person or anything like that. I just, it's a competition of saying that I was good enough to figure out the fish, on that day in that tournament and win at that level. And that's something that's very important to me. Yeah, I don't think there's no doubt you're going to do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, it's fishing, man. It's funny. You know, you, you see people get hot and go on streaks and, and yeah. then, you know, I, so I don't listen, I, I don't ever count my cars before, uh, before we're done. So I, I, I just kind of always, I don't get ahead of myself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I watched, uh, I watched your announcement on like your Instagram reel earlier today. And, uh, you mentioned, you, uh, you're going to have a crew following you and doing like the YouTube thing. I feel like that's the, like you did her the best way because you just caught the shit out of them, proved yourself, attracted the attention of the sponsors. Now they're throwing a camera in your boat where, you know, if you would have just been catching them a little bit and trying to do your own, like 
social media and trying to lug around cameras and all this. And it's just like takes away from your fishing game a little bit. Now you can just focus on fish and you don't have to worry about the editing and lugging batteries and cameras and everything around. Like they'll have you dialed in. It'll take a little bit of your time here and there, but mm -hmm. it seems like that's like the way to do, or that's the fishing first approach. It Listen, I, I'm very thankful for the way that it all worked out and I wouldn't have it any other way, but it doesn't seem like that's kind of the popular way to go about doing that because I think everybody wants a shortcut to success. They're like, well, if I can figure out how to make this video go viral, I can get a bunch of sponsors and then I'm a pro and then I can just figure it out as I go. And, and maybe it works for some guys. Um, I mean, I haven't seen no that one, yet. well, there's no one that's done it better than Milliken. Like I, and I don't no. know the guy personally don't even watch a lot of his stuff, but I mean, in a sense, like, I know how successful he's been. I know that he just now kind of really got into the tournament scene. He just qualified for the elites. He kind of did it the complete opposite way, but he did it as good as you could ever, like, yeah. I, he just freaking killed it. Um, so there's definitely two different ways to do that, right? Um, well, he but had I, it so dialed in that, like, yeah, he, he's got it so dialed in to where his whole following wants to watch, like, the latest – bass tactics you know the last yeah. couple of years he's not running around fishing for pike with hot dogs in the arctic or all this dumb shit you have to do on youtube all he's doing is honing sharpening his skills yeah. promoting his products and getting ready for the next tournament while yeah. making a video like there's no better layout than than what he's got like you said wow. that's that's doing it right yeah, I don't think that he – I don't doubt his ability to catch him and compete in tournaments not one bit. I don't even hardly follow the guy. But what I have – and I, it's not that I don't follow. It's just I don't – man, I spend my time out there trying to get better at catching back. I don't watch a lot of social media. But but with that, I don't doubt his ability to catch him, and I'm sure he's going to do great in the Elite Series and all that. All I'm saying is is that, like, I if, if a kid was to ask me, like, what does it take for me to be a pro – well, most people's answer to that is going to say, well, you need to get, you need to, you need to build your social media. Right? right. And I don't tell them that. Like, I'm not going to tell them that. I'm going to say, listen, go out there and go have fun and go fishing. Go enjoy bass fishing. If you love bass fishing, go enjoy bass fishing and do it as much as you can, as much as you want to. And if you get to a point where you're overly obsessed with it and you don't want to do anything else in life, then maybe professional bass fishing is a sport for you. And then at that point in time, you've probably put enough into it that you're going to be good enough that you're going to win a little bit. And when you win a little bit, you invest it a little bit further and you keep building slowly, but surely you just keep on building. And eventually people, like you said, have a, like, I've been able to attract the attention of outside companies that want to work with me now. And it's a natural, authentic relationship where I'm not trying to be somebody I'm not. I'm not trying to have to do a bunch of stuff that I don't want to do. I get to enjoy what I do and I get to competitively bass fish. And so um, that's, that's my advice to a lot of these kids and stuff that are coming up. They're so wrapped up in how do I get sponsors that they're forgetting about how to catch bass. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Like whenever, and I'm getting long winded on this, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty like, I feel pretty strongly about this. You know, whenever a parent, of a 10 year old comes up to me and is like, how do I get my 10 year old sponsors? I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. At 10 years old, I didn't even know what a sponsor was, you, you know? And I, I'm not saying that it's not okay to like prepare your, your kids for success and teach them marketing and business and all of that. Cause that's great. But at 10, I really feel like they need to be focused on having fun and fishing. You know, I mean, come on. You it's know, it's kind of like the hockey parents up in Minnesota. Yeah. I mean, they're pushing those kids when they're in diapers. I mean, I mean, it, most of them get burnt out on it before they ever get a chance yeah. to be successful. Yeah. And, you know, the thing people don't like when people are looking at tournament fishing or going to the next level or whatever, they don't realize that you can do it, you know, on your own. Like you, most people do have to go out on their own dime in the first few and, you know, if you suck, then you got to keep rolling that dime. But like, you can definitely do nine opens with a full-time job. Like we've proven that this year and people are whining about money and sponsors and everything like that. Just get your ass to work and get more. Like it's a simple recipe and it's, there's no shortcuts at all. There's not. And, and, you know, it's all about how much, how important is it to you? What are you willing to sacrifice to do that? What, what are you able to sacrifice to make that work? 
you know, it may be a, as simple as this. I see guys all the time, well, I can't afford that. I can't afford a live scope or I can't afford a new boat. Really? Because you go to the bar and you spend $200 a weekend. You add that up four weekends in a month, you done spent $800. How could you have allocated that funds to your investment in your, in your career? You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, granted, you might have a family or something that you don't, you know, that you can't afford to do that with. And that's okay. That's awesome that you do. Um, you don't think there's times when I'm on the road and I'm like, man, it'd be nice if I had somebody to enjoy this with. But I mean, it's just a sacrifice that I've made up until this point in my life. And do I want those things? Absolutely. One day, do I hope to have those things? Absolutely. But I've had to sacrifice that up until this point at 31 years old. Um, there, there are ways to make it happen. Just like you said, even with a full-time job, it might make you, you might have to eat freaking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but damn it, like there's ways to do it. And it frustrates the hell out of me when I hear guys say that they can't. No, you just don't want too bad enough. And I hate to say that, but it just is what it is. Yeah. The one that drives me the most wild is the travel, like guys bitching that they can't. Now, I can't do the opens next year. Like the travel's ridiculous. Well, I, like I had to do three events where I had on my way home to work Monday morning, 25 hours away. I had to drive all, you know, if there's a wind delay or you make a cut, that means driving all of Saturday night, all of Sunday and all of Sunday night and just rolling right into work. And like, it can be done. Yeah. Well, if they're fussing about travel for the opens and professional fishing is not for them, it's just not yeah. like, it's not like, and that's okay. It's okay that it's not for them. If you don't like the traveling, then it's okay. Like fish local tournaments, have fun and enjoy bass fishing. Watch Bass Live on FS1. Like, listen, it's okay. <laughs> you know, like that's the whole thing. But in fishing, like we're so entitled, you know, like we're so entitled that damn it, like I deserve to, I don't want to travel. I don't want to sacrifice all this, but I deserve to be on the Elite Series. And it just don't work like that, man. No. You know, it don't. It, it, it just doesn't. And it's frustrating whenever I see guys on social media putting down guys that are putting everything they have into it and making those sacrifices. And, and they, they're putting down the organizations. They're putting them down the whole entire sport. And all the negativity doesn't do anything but hurt it. It doesn't make it better. Just because you're whining about it doesn't mean that you're helping it, you know? And, and it, it's just frustrating to see that. And, again, I'm getting off on another rant. But it's like, damn it, you know, whenever I was freaking 14 years old, I really want to play professional baseball as bad as anybody in the world. But you know what? I'm five foot five and I never got any taller and my fastball never got more than 81 miles an hour. And guess what? <laughs> that ain't good enough to play professional baseball. And my place in life was not professional baseball and it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair how hard I worked, but guess what? It's okay. I'm okay. I'm fishing for a living now. Life's good. You know, I mean, it's just part of life. It don't always work out the way that we see it, you know, going. Yeah, man. You got a good attitude. <laughs> <laughs> he has a, he he has a, about as genuine as she gets in the fishing game that I've run across. So we're, uh, yeah, we're happy to have you on and sharing your story, man. This is uh I appreciate it. It's good stuff. Back to the back to the fishing side a little bit. A lot of guys when they jump from you know 80 boat fields or 100 boat fields with just a marshal, jump in to a 225 boat field co-anglers you know lunch kits all over the damn boat rod socks flying all over i feel like you're like with your toyota series experience you're you got to be more ready for that than anyone i think it helps there's definitely a big difference in that right like you're yeah. thinking about what like what tyler rivette did last year at the opens or man at the elite series at okeechobee and then you try to say well man like i know that'll be going on sure it will be but with 225 versus 100 or whatever it was like and it was kind of untapped at that time like you you've got to think about stuff like that you know you've got to be prepared for those circumstances that you're going to get yourself into with that many boats with co-anglers and all of that stuff um i think my prep like yeah the toyota series have definitely helped prepare me for that i mean we just fished a toyota championship with 250 boats or something you know so um being mentally tough is definitely key in them type situations yeah are you uh like when you have a co-angler in your boat do you like really feel that or do you just is it nice to have someone to fish with once in a while or like is it just you just do you and it is what it is or do you change I, your strategy or game plan at all no i think that man the, the most important i think that 
you know, your energy, like the energy you put off is, is resonated pretty well with, with your co handler, right? Like if yeah. you have good energy, they're going to have good energy. Like, you, you know, even in situations where I'm live scoping and everything, I, I like, I've never had hardly an issue. I had one issue with one guy in like the last nine years of fishing tournaments, you know, where it was just a miserable day. And literally, I mean, knock on wood, that's like the only one of the only bad experiences like I can only think of is that one day. And it was just, it was just, I mean, I could have like, I could have ended my fishing career right there. We could have went to the bank and beat the hell out of it. <laughs> like, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was bad. Like this dude, this dude got to me, but honestly, I, even then that was kind of my fault. Cause I let him get to me and it was over nothing, like absolutely nothing. But, um, I typically like, I have a great time with my co-anglers. Like I always have. And I, i usually, I, I think most guys get out of my boat, even if, you know, we don't have that success, much of a successful day, like, and say, look, I had a good time, you know? And I, I don't think they truly mean that just because look, I know that a guy's invested a lot of money. They're out there, you know, and they also know that I'm out here trying to make a living doing it. So I, I think that, and I don't have to tell them that, like, I don't, that's not, that's not right either. Like I, I think it's just about being a good person. If you're a good person in the front of that boat, they're going to be a good person in the back of that boat. We're all going to have a good time. We're going to go on about our way. You know, I think the, 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 uh, the vibe there goes a long ways and, and you're in control of that whenever, you know, you start the day. Yeah. It is nice to share. Like if you have a big day, you know, it's nice to have someone in the boat to like share it with. Oh, if absolutely. I'm, like that, that make cause there's, you know, there are plenty of opens where, There'll probably be more co-anglers this year, but with the one month cutoff, like, you know, locals could go on their own lake for a month. So they're not going to sign up to hop in the back of a boat and stay off the lake for a month. So they're way down, like a lot of co-anglers. Um, but some of those days you'd be like, oh, sweet, I got no co. And if you went out there and mashed them, it'd be like, you know, <laughs> just hanging out with yourself. It was like, oh. not, not me. I kind of, I mean, I, I would, I'll kind of like that because then everybody knows how I caught them, really. <laughs> so. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, uh, I, I mean, hey, the biggest bag I've ever had was last year at Rayburn. I had right at 33, and I had a guy with me that day. It was in the Toyota Series event. And, you know, we had, I mean, I mean, I, I think he had as much fun as I did. He was shaking as bad as I was every time one would hit the net, you know. So it was, it was a cool experience. It really was. And, um, there's been times when I've been out there by myself too, and invitational events with nobody and, and, and had a good time with that too. So yeah, I enjoy, I, I'll say this, I, I keep in touch with a lot of the guys that have been in my boat over the last several years. And uh, some of them have become, have become great friends. I mean, great friends. You never know who you're going to meet, you know? And so I, I, I really enjoy that. Like I enjoy meeting new people. I truly do. And so, um, it's all part of it. Looking forward to it. It's all going to be fine. And uh, I think as long, you know, at the end of the day, guys watching this and maybe new new guys that are new to the opens that are going to have co-anglers, you hear all these horror stories on the co-angler side and the boater side. But I can truly say that, man, I think your attitude dictates a lot of that. And as long as you respect people, they're going to respect you. And you can go out there and have a good day. You know, I, I think a lot of the times that there are bad experiences, they could have been avoided. It's usually because a boater's become a – you know, a butthole to somebody that he shouldn't have been, or maybe a co-angler is just being, you know, I, I, whatever. But it, it, if, if everybody just respects one another, I think it, it flows pretty smooth. Yeah. And worst case scenario, you get a damn good story out of, you know, out of the deal yeah, to tell I, your buddies I, I, if you I, get a bad egg. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the story of that one, but I'll, that's a story that I'll never forget. Like, and I, it's funny. Like, it's a pretty good one. Like, you know, I mean. It's uh, and it, it it's a pretty good laugh. So yeah, I got a good story out of that one bad experience. Well, you don't have to use the guy's name. <laughs> Let her roll. I, I don't even, I don't even remember the guy's name, but I just remember like this was well before forward facing sonar and stuff, you know. And I I pulled up on this rock, man. I mean, we were in the middle of Lake Ontario. There are bass everywhere, and I pulled up on this one boulder, you know. And I and like I dropped and before my bait ever hit the bottom. I catch like a, a two pounder, you know, just, I happen to catch a little one off of it. Right. So I'm fighting this fish. And as I'm like boat flipping it, he pitches up in front of the boat and we had done drifted off the, you know, so he, the, his drop shot like goes by my ear, you know, like right in front of the trolling motor. I didn't say nothing, whatever. There's like, I knew there was a bunch of fish on the rock. So I'm unhooking the two pounder. He sets the hook. He catches like a four and a half. I'm like, all right, cool. Whatever. Same thing. I drift up to the front of the boat. I hook like a three pounder or whatever. 
I'm fighting it. I get it in the boat. He's done unhooked that one, put it in the box. He flips back up there and catches another four pounder again. The drop shot goes <laughs> on my ear, and I'm like, okay. So he's got two, you know, for eight and a half pounds. We're about five minutes into the day. I said, look, man. I said, I look just if if you don't mind, just don't cast up in front in front of me like that that bad, please. And he's like, well, I know what you're doing. I know there's a rock there, and I know what you're doing. So I'm gonna keep doing it. And I'm like, oh. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, we're in the middle of Ontario. You, you got four, you got eight and a half off of two, five minutes in. We're going to be okay. You're going to have a good day. Just let me do my thing, you know, a little bit. You know, just respect me, right? It's just a respect thing, right? And uh, anyway, so we kind of got off to that start. And then a little bit later, we go to another spot and I see one underneath the back transducer, you know, just kind of hovering. So I turn around and, you know, this is all 2D stuff. I turn around, I pitch you know, beside the driver side console and I catch a five pounder and he refuses to net it or help me with it. And he's like, that's bullshit, dude. I'm not netting that fish. You told me I can't cast in front of the boat, but yet you can cast back here by me. And I lost. My- <laughs> I was like, I paid for this boat. I paid for those graphs and I paid the entry fee to tell me where I can cast. Cause I can cast wherever I want. Cause I paid the extra money to do so. And I know obviously you're a great fisherman. You've told me how much money you make. And you told me how badass of a guy you are. So go pay the entry fee and be a boater next time. Like, and we just, I mean, we absolutely got into it out there in the middle of like Ontario. There wasn't nothing but seagulls around in small mouth. We about <laughs> killed each other. Like, it was a deal. And finally, he's like, well, man, you ain't got to be an asshole. And I'm like, oh, no, bro. Like, I try to be really nice to you. You surpassed the asshole mark a long time ago. And now you got to cuss it because I'm already mad about it again, even though this happened seven years ago. But I am very calm, cool, and collected, and I am nice to everyone around me. But whenever you pass that mark, like, listen, I, a short man syndrome comes out. Like, I ain't afraid to call it what it is. I get pissed. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you you get a good story out of a bad experience. Oh, that it's is a good story. Always a silver lining to her. You might have one. Or, you might get one or two more this year in the opens. I'm thinking. Well, it's funny because I did the podcast with Shane Campbell. Uh, he fished all the opens uh, last year. I did the Juice podcast with him yesterday, and uh, and he he was like, "Man, it's a good thing you've been out here at Rayburn." Uh, he said because. You know, it'll kind of a little bit prepare you for what you're fixing to see on the opens. He's like, man, them guys are, they're ruthless. Like, you catch a bias, they're coming. And I'm like, ah, whatever, you know. But yeah. he's hes like, man, them guys are relentless, like bad, bad. And I'm like, ah, it can't be that bad. So, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see anything as crazy as I expected. Like, we fished this tournament in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and it's like, right. it's more condensed than any tournament, you know, there is, any open I've yeah. ever seen. And yeah. uh, they're like, you know, it's team tournaments so of like, if they see your net, like you got to go through, like you need to paint your net black hoop and all, and like right. only get it on a four and a half pounder plus, like they yeah. will literally just shit hawk right in on you. And I didn't, I didn't see anything crazy like that. Like in practice. Yeah. If you're, you know, leaning on one or something and someone's driving by, you're going to hear the motor slow down and maybe hear a little beep on the graph, but <laughs> it, uh, I didn't see anything too crazy. Did you, Brad? Uh, not last year. Last year was good. I mean, the year, two prior years before, we went to Lake Oneida, where it, that was a complete shit show. But mm-hmm. we fished big enough waters. I I bet you leech will be a lot like that. It'll be pretty tight on leech, but. I yeah. Mean, That's weird because leech is like, I don't know anything about leech. And I mean, you know, I'm saying about it. But- uh, I mean, I've been there once, and we caught a giant muskie, and that's all we caught. This was when I was in college, but um, we just went there for a couple hours. But it's big, like really, really big, right? But I'm sure, I guess, it fish is small. It it's real big. There's a lot of dead water in it, and mm-hmm. it's really condensed for the most part. I mean, I'm sure with the opens going up there, people are going to figure out different ways of catching them because mm-hmm. it really hasn't. It probably I has. Think- te- it has 10 tournaments on there a year, but like the biggest tournaments are 50, 60 boats. It's never seen over a hundred boats before. So that'll be the, that'll be the kicker in it. Yeah. I'm excited to do like, to go to these new places like this though. Like Leech has never had a tournament with over a hundred boats. How cool is it that we get to go there? You know, Champlain is my favorite fishery in the country, but I actually, you know, aside from not getting to go see like, basically my, my New York family is what I call them. I, I don't mind not going to Champlain this year. I'm Champlain out in a sense that like, 
it's we've beat it to death so many daggum yeah. times. Been there so many times. Like, you know, it's just the same. I, I like going to new places. You know, I like to get to go and it, on the uh, to a place where nobody has any history and we get to go figure it out, you know. Yeah. And uh guys will get some insight or some inside info and do all that kind of stuff. But but for the most part, it's gonna be a fresh tournament and it'll be exciting to watch and be a part of. What uh what's your yeah. favorite what's your favorite one going into the season? What are the one what's the one you're looking forward to most? Uh well it's been really cold here in Texas. So I'm yeah. looking forward to Okeechobee right now, honestly. Of course I'll probably bring a cold front with me and screw up that whole deal. But um as of right now, I think it's supposed to be like high seventies and pretty nice. So I'm really looking forward to getting down there. Uh, I wasn't expecting to go to Okeechobee until a few weeks ago, so it was kind of a pleasant surprise. I had a lot of fun there in 23 in the Invitational. Um, I think the schedule's overall pretty good. I, I don't yeah. – um, Leech is – I'm really excited about that one. Uh, Lacrosse has always been my nemesis. I love that place. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorite places to go fish, but I always seem to – you know, I think I've barely got a check there one time. So that one's going to be something that – and, like, I know how to catch them there. It's just always kick me in the butt. Like I always try to go to a different pool or I go do something that, you know, and I just, whatever, get locked out or something stupid happens. So um, that one's definitely one that's on my radar for like, eh, you could have went somewhere else on that one. But just because, man, so much is riding on that tournament, being at the end of the year, and then, um, you you know, you find the winning fish in seven and you you get locked out, you know? That sucks. Like you can't. You know? It was like that was like how the opens finished at Harris this year for the final event. Yeah, like there was a lot of shit going wild, you know, yeah. with locks and a like a popka and you crazy gotta be smart about happening. it. If you know that if you know that you you need a solid event, right? You're like in eighth or ninth place or you're in seventh place, you can't go to a popka. Like I mean you just I mean, like I don't think, you know, I, I don't know. Like it's just, with the, I, I, I was in eight, I was in eighth and I tried to go <laughs> and, uh, I was like, I'll just fish, uh, uh, Dora. I was like, I'll just fish Dora. Yeah. Let everyone go through. I might, it might've been a ninth. I was inside of the freaking top 10 and on going into the last event of the year. I did not mean to open up this can of worms. No, no, oh, it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah. So I was just, you know, fishing some grass. Couple boat. I had a late boat number, so I was like, I'll just wait an hour or whatever. And Brandon McMillan drove up to me and he's like, She's a no go, bub. The lock's closed. And I'm like, Oh man, good thing I didn't waste all that time running through there because I was going to go. You know, I had, I had caught a small limit. I was like, Even more reason to go, you know, because I still needed like 13, 14 pounds a day. And you mm-hmm. kind of, that was cuts kind of swinging at the Harris chain. And um, so I didn't get in. So I was, you know, hanging back in the grass. And then Milliken drives by me, like, you know, 10 minutes after uh, Nick Millen told me, like, I just see him. And I'm like, oh, he's going to go up and get locked out too. Well, he got, he got in, like they had fixed it like 10 minutes before he got there. So all these guys turned around and he got in. Dang, man, that's nuts. But, you know, he could have easily gone there and, and got locked out the other way or zeroed or whatever. But it was just, the field was so tight at the end of the year that, if you were inside of the top, you know, if you were from like sixth to fifteenth, you kind of still had to swing, right? Yeah. So, like, it seems and, like an absolute ridiculous thing to do, but it worked for guys like Milliken. Yeah. Well, in that place, you know, I will. Milliken had done kind of fell fallen out of it. Like, wasn't he kind of in fifteenth or something like yeah, that? Yeah. He was like in eighteenth, so yeah, he he absolutely needed to swing for so it. He but, was. Uh, he was like, I win this event or basically or I don't make it and ended up finishing second. He still made it, you know? So that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, that's, well, this, it's, I hate that it didn't work out for you, you know? Um, it just, so did you ever, did you actually go down there? No. So I, uh, I just fished around, caught like nine pounds. And then the second day I was like, now I really got to go swing for it. So I tried going there first thing and there were 50 boats lined up. So I was like, Okay, there's no way. So I came out, fish Dora. My co angler had 10 pounds for three. I uh I broke two off, like never, you know, haven't broken off a fish since fluorocarbon came out. <laughs> and uh so I I broke two off somehow 
on two different rods and uh lost two more big ones and just like you know pissed her away but i like just kind of looked at the sky and was like all right you know just wasn't wasn't my girl well it so. sounds like you, you made good decisions like you made the right you inevitably like you had the opportunities so you put yourself in a position to be successful it just didn't go your way and and fishing sometimes we all know it just doesn't like you can do everything right put yourself in position to be successful and some days it just doesn't happen like and that it it hurts man no doubt yeah it sucked for a bit and i'm like what well, you know if just it's so volatile like especially when the race was that close you know that mm-hmm. whole top 20 it's like a bad decision here a jump off here like kyle austin missed by two uh two spots and he jumped off a five pounder like five minutes before weigh in like in front of like 20 people like that would have put you in right there and you know you don't think about those all season until it comes down to it but that's wild it's gonna be fun to watch this year there's a lot of you hammers that came over and and all you know everyone below ninth i think Ian Blake, Sylvester, and Shane Campbell, is he doing it? No, I don't think Shane is this year. He's taking a year off. Yeah, so I looked at the list, and I think it was just me, him, and Blake were the are not doing it, and then most most of the guys are back, and then plus a few FLW hammers. McCormick's coming back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, so we're – obviously, both of, both of us are working heavily with Strike King and Lose, so they're going to do a Kings of Bass this year like they did last year with Kevin on his last ride with, with the Bass Pro Tour. So this year, the Kings of Bass is actually going to be with me and Tristan trying to qualify for the uh, elites. So that's going to be really fun. Uh, I think we're going to do 11 episodes. I'm probably giving way too much juice because I'm probably going to get kicked. <laughs> this Because I don't know that all this is for sure official, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this is our plans. Um, actually, I know it is because we just booked some hotels today. But uh, as far as the details, <laughs> I probably – detailed in that but yeah we're you gonna, can hang on to your details we're gonna we're gonna cover that whole deal and uh i think it's gonna be 11 episodes and stuff so um it'll be exciting to kind of share that journey with you guys you know uh really yeah. looking forward to that uh as, especially with my own social channels as well we're just doing like a video log series where we're just covering the everyday day-to-day stuff like i don't want to focus as much on the tournament stuff you can watch the tournaments and you can see how i did in the tournament I just want to show guys what it's like traveling, having fun, just enjoying the outdoors. We're going to do hunting stuff, fishing stuff, a little bit of everything, you know. Um, so yeah. it's going to be exciting to share that with everyone and uh, looking forward to a great year. Yeah, man. That's awesome. And the one thing about watching the Opens and following it and probably why the the viewership has increased so much is if you're following an Angler of the Year race on uh, the Elites or the BPT, your eyes are just on, you know, one or two guys at the top and, you know, for only one person, it's life changing Right for the opens. You're, you know, you're watching that cut line and there's nine people that are, you know, going to change the course of their life in that. So it's like yeah. the, the story behind it is just, you know, it's, it's pretty engaging. It's damn fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you hopping on. You got anything else for this? This fella before he cut him loose, Brad? Uh, all I can say, he has the best attitude of anyone I've ever spoken to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate that, man. I mean, it goes a long ways and on the water and stuff. And, hey, granted, I can have a bad attitude at times. I told y'all a story a while ago about how I had a bad attitude. So uh, we all have our days, man, but I'm very thankful to be doing what I'm doing, and I try to keep a, a good attitude as much as I can. And the better attitude you have, the more success you're going to have one way or the other. So um, that's that's the goal there. But anyways, I appreciate you guys having me. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, we'll see you on the water and down the road. Yeah, thanks, thanks for man. coming on, bud. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Be Bye. watching for you at the first one. Good luck. Thanks, man. See y'all. See Take ya. care. <clears throat> all right, Brad. Hopefully that guy, uh, some of his positivity rubs off on our toxicity, eh? Yeah, he's way <laughs> too positive. I no mean, way, gotta, that's good, man. You got to raise the bar. Yeah, like I – and I can see where the rodeo stuff, when he was telling us that, like, you know, for, for most of those people in the rodeo, it's like fishing. They don't have a lot of money. They travel a ton, and you have to be rock solid where I bet you that translates over really well.
Yeah. You put a rodeo guy in a bass boat, he ain't going to be sitting at the hotel at 3.30 during practice. No. <laughs> That's going to be a damn grinder, son. Yeah, and he's so happy he doesn't have to ride a bull and get his teeth kicked <laughs> in. He's like, this That's is awesome. Atti- That's why he's got such a positive attitude. He's off the bull. Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, that was fun, man. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, talking to the boys down at the Derb and um, following along and, and being able to run these shows from the comforts of my garage while it's minus 25 out and you guys are bass fishing in Florida. Oh, you're going down the same time we are. Wow, I'm just going for a club derby. Uh, I don't know. You qualify in there, you qualify in one other one, and you beat us to the punch, basically, right? You qualify, you make the top 20, and you go win the next one. Aren't you in the elites? Yeah, you could get in for 400 bucks. <laughs> All <laughs> you got to do is beat 2,000 guys. <laughs> Yeah, but if you go, you know, dollar per dollar, I mean, I'm sure, you know, it's pretty close. Yeah, could do it every year for the next 20 years for the same price as one open season. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just All right, man. Well, uh, I'll let you go. And, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Into the Great Wide Open Season 2. And we'll uh, we'll see you on the next one right after Okeechobee here. Thanks. Who's there?